Okay. Okay, so picking up where we left off with regards to enduring issues, we were almost done with that assignment. Okay, so you should see me and you should see the screen share. Um, right here. Okay. Okay, this is where we were. Hopefully you can see me and see the my shared screen. Okay. So Ackerman decries the lack of a social construct to sustain the war, by which he means a war tax or draft that would have, in his view, entailed greater buy-in from the American public. Okay, so let's get back to where we were. Okay, Ackerman decries, it's not decrees, is it? Decries, decrees, the lack of a social construct to sustain the war, by which he means a war tax or draft that would have, in his view, entailed greater buy-in from the American public. But he leaves unclear how such, how such steps would have helped and ignores their political implausibility. At the same time, he implies that the United States should have rationalized keeping troops in Afghanistan instead of pulling out by claiming they were not at war, such as the United States has done in Syria and parts of Africa. But it strains credulity to suggest that even keeping a relatively small number of United States troops in the country indefinitely would have meant that there was anything other than a war going on. In 2021 alone, there were over 35,000 war-related deaths in Afghanistan. What is more to suggest, what is more to suggest that United States officials should have downplayed the war sits uneasily with Ackerman's contention that they also should have encouraged ordinary Americans to personally invest in it more. It's difficult to invest in something that's not in your own backyard. It's difficult to invest in something of that which you do not see. If we only watch Fox 5 News, and if most news channels, with the exception of CNN and PBS NewsHour, maybe MSNBC, if, if that's all we're seeing, which is, it's just, it's, it's not, it doesn't speak to what's going on around the world. If Americans don't see that, if they're not exposed to what's happening around the world um, by the news media when they turn it on, they're not going to invest in anything of that which they cannot is intangible, of that which they don't understand, of that which they don't care about. Okay, the dinuma. So see, see, it's the same. Look, the dinuma in global studies. We have this in ELA. The dinuma is the conclusion. It's at the end of the plot diagram for ELA. It comes so it's exposition, rising action. Uh, the what is it? Um, the conflict, then the climax, then the falling action, and then the dinuma is the conclusion. So they use they mirror global studies mirrors the same language that we use for ELA. Even though it's it's in real time and it's the news is real, we still tell it by way of a unit of stories because it is a story. Okay, so the ending, the conclusion. Ackerman played a laudable role in helping Afghans escape their country as the Taliban advanced on Kabul in August 2021. And his deception of the evacuation as chaotic is undeniably true. Meaning like Miller, Lauren Miller, right, who wrote this article is saying that Elliot Ackerman is not being truthful in his text in that he knew that the evacuation was haphazard, was chaotic, it wasn't planned. But his vantage point from thousands of miles away could offer only a limited view. 
He weaves descriptions of text messages, emails, and phone calls about evacuating Afghans with vignettes from his family vacation in Italy, which happened at the same time, a juxtaposition, another literary term that is hardly illuminating. So meaning he doesn't teach us anything we don't know. Ackerman provides limited portraits of the Afghan evacuees he, assist, he assisted. As he notes, he didn't know most of them. His efforts to aid strangers in need were admirable, but the lack of a personal connection means that readers who want a rich account of the final days of the United States war in Afghanistan, including the experience of the Afghans whose lives were turned upside down, will need to look elsewhere. So there's a lack of a personal connection. Um, because even though he was on the ground in Afghanistan, he is writing his book from the comforts of the United States. Despite the book's subtitle, its focus is not the end of the United States war in Afghanistan. Ackerman was not there during the withdrawal, and he does not suggest that he has closely studied the denouement, like the final moments, like conclusion, the ending, the end result, the resolution. Resolution. Nonetheless, he regards the timing of the withdrawal as arbitrary and its handling as a betrayal. Um, he proposes that the United States should have extracted more Afghans and sooner, but nothing would have precipitated widespread panic and the collapse of the Afghan government with greater certainty than the United States evacuating hundreds of thousands of Afghans well in advance of the withdrawal date, whenever that date was set to be. And it is doubtful that a more deliberate evacuation, rather than a quick and reactive one, could have been sustained with less chaos. As the government crumbled and the Taliban rolled into Kabul, Ackerman's position presupposes that the United States should have risked this highly probable sequence of events, but Ackerman, like many critics of the withdrawal process, fails to acknowledge the dilemma that U.S. policymakers faced. It is undeniable that aspects of the emergency evacuation could have benefited from advanced planning. For example, the United States government could have processed more special immigrant visas for which Afghans who worked for the United States are allowed to apply. But the notion that a massive, hold on, that a massive evacuation could have been carried out well ahead of August 31st, the August 31st deadline without turmoil is fanciful. Furthermore, since the withdrawal, the United States and private groups have arranged for passage out of the country for thousands more Afghans, including many who were vulnerable or who had worked with the United States forces. In the final years of the war, it became clear that Washington's choice in Afghanistan was between losing quickly or losing slowly. Okay, this is very important here. When United States President Joe Biden decided in April 2021 to completely pull out, he chose to lose fast. Though how fast was uncertain, Ackerman claims that the Afghan government had fought the Taliban to a stalemate when President Biden announced his withdrawal. This is false. In fact, the Taliban had been gaining ground for years, especially since the United States began to draw down its forces after 2014. Okay. So we started to withdraw United States soldiers from Afghanistan after 2014. So I think, I think, I, I can't remember the year that the United States troops caught 
Osama bin Laden. They did not catch him in Afghanistan. He was in, he was in Pakistan, I, I thought. And we caught him like 2010. Like it took us 10 years to catch the leader of the Taliban. <laughs> um, okay, so, right. so just because you catch or kill the revolutionary doesn't mean that you kill the revolution. So Osama bin Laden, who was responsible in tandem with the Taliban for the 2001, September 11th um, World Trade Center um, uh, bombings, like the planes drove into the World Trade Center in Manhattan, in New York City, right? We, we caught him like 10 years after, but just because we caught him doesn't mean that doesn't mean that the Taliban still don't have a voice in Afghanistan, right? So, how do I explain it? So what's frustrating is that when you have an organization, no matter what they are or who they are, whether you consider them a terrorist organization or not, when you have people fly planes into your building you have to try to like endure understandings and rationalize gee why would they do that right so um like for example instead of feeling away or getting angry or like focusing on being angry or being xenophobic towards um people from the middle east and or people of the muslim faith you need to you need to focus on well how can i how can i prevent this from happening again that's how you endure understanding why oh why what would possess somebody like what would possess people to practice and scheme for years to fly planes into the twin towers like who does that like why would you do that so from my perspective the understanding that we, the United States should have endured is that the Taliban, they have something to say and they want us to listen. So after you fly planes into the World Trade Towers and kill innocent people and affect negative change and, and hurt people for no reason, I'm listening. You have my attention. But what do we do? We go into Afghanistan and we don't, offer them our ear or a seat at the table like okay we don't negotiate with terrorists yeah i get it but sometimes you have to negotiate with terrorists <laughs> if you want to affect sustainable change because we we've been in afghanistan since then since a long time <laughs> long time since i don't know after 2001 to, to now to august 2021 and we didn't we don't have anything to show for it. So we're not learning the life lesson. Like it's ironic that the United States hasn't endured understanding as per the power the Taliban has and holds in Afghanistan, even after two decades of having us occupy their country. That's a problem. That's a, that's a problem. Because if we don't understand somebody's perspective, we can't shut them down or teach them how to change their face and have a different perception on the world. Or we can't get anywhere with them if we don't understand where they're coming from. And we just say, well, you're a terrorist, so you don't count. I'm not going to listen to you. Like you drove two planes into two buildings. You have my attention. What is it that you need me to do? What is it that you want? That's where I think nobody wins. After that point, some United States officials called the situation an eroding stalemate, an oxymoron. So eroding means corrosive, that it's um, dying, like turning like into rust. And a stalemate means that you don't move. And this is also the very device. 
Um, moreover, Ghani's domestic legitimacy and grip on the political system had become shaky, and he remained dependent on foreign aid and military support. Once Biden decided to withdraw, there were two plausible outcomes to the war that might have taken hold. In the first scenario, the Taliban would gain ground, sparking a protracted battle to control cities, which would possibly have devolved into a multifactional civil war. In the second scenario, which is the one that materialized, the, with, the withdrawal would provoke a crisis of confidence among among Afghans, leading to a rapid collapse of their government and security forces. Is that really the time? How is this possible? It would have been difficult for the United States to predict the likelihood of the second scenario because it depends on accurately evaluating how a vast number of Afghans would feel about continuing their fight, a measurement the United States had little capability to make. So I'm not saying that the Afghans want the Taliban in their country, but some of them do. So we have to equip them so that they can mobilize for themselves against that group. There was always a risk that the chaos that blighted the Dinuma would have occurred in any withdrawal. Some critiques of how the Biden administration handled the pullout, including several leveled by Ackerman, are fair. But by dwelling so much on what happened during 15 days in 2021, his book implies that the principal failures had to do with how the United States got out of Afghanistan rather than how it got in and what it did while it was there. There you go. There you go. What the final days show most of all is the hollowness of the Afghan government and the security institutions that the United States tried so hard to build over two decades. If the story that Americans come to tell themselves about the Afghan war focuses not only those realities, but on the organization and timing of the United States exit, it will distract them from the war's most important lessons. There is a limit to what American money and willpower can achieve. And the best way to avoid having to get out of an unwinnable war is to avoid getting into one. So that right here is the author's purpose, the life lesson, the learning gleaned, the message. Okay. Let's Okay, identify the enduring issues. Okay. All right, so here, let's see, show you. Okay, so is it a challenge or a problem? Yes, it existed in the past and exists today, yes. It has affected a lot of people. Yes. If you have been given five documents, there is evidence of the challenge or problem and at least three of the documents. Okay, so what do we have to do here? You will need to support your choice of enduring issues with evidence in the documents or topics you learn in the class. Mm -hmm. Okay, look for evidence of challenges, problems, identify an issue based on what you find, be specific. Okay, instead of choosing conflict, try identifying an enduring issue like conflict between ethnic groups or civil wars. So this would be conflict. Conflict between the United States and the Taliban, right? Okay, do not stick to the list. If you see evidence of an enduring issue in a set of documents or topics you have learned in class, this is in the list, choose that one. Do not limit yourself to the list. For example, hatred and pollution are not on the list, but are enduring issues. And you identify the causes. 
and or effects. Instead of choosing an issue like conflict, identify what causes conflict, like conflict caused by competition over resources. In this case, it's conflict caused by um, the conflict. The conflict is caused by um, the United States occupying Afghanistan and thinking that we know best and trying to build a government there like ours without creating any buy-in or um, talking to stakeholders or involving community leaders or giving anybody else a voice like the Taliban so that we can get it right and then it's sustainable. We just do our own thing because we don't care what people think. And then after 20 years, it collapses because nobody believes in our idea but, our, but, but us. It's not enough. So this conflict has led to evacuations of 80,000 plus um, Afghans from Kabul and 100, over 120,000 people altogether. Okay. Okay. So she has it like this. This. Okay. Let's see. I thought we had another page here. Yes. Okay. So here you go. All right. So you have conflict. We know that this article speaks to that. I think it also speaks to a desire for power. I think it also speaks to um, interconnectedness, right? Impact of interconnectedness, conflict, desire for power. Yep. Um, environmental impact abroad, definitely. Okay, but we have to, we're going to pick one. I think it's one that we're picking. Okay. Okay, so now we go back up. I'm sorry. I hope I'm doing this right. Okay. So the enduring issue is conflict. The general top, oh my God, that is not the time. General topics were, okay, specific class topics, current events. Okay. Okay, so let's do it this way. So the enduring issue to go. Okay. Okay. In the in the text or in the review essay or whatever. In the political text. Um, what's the name of it? In the article, The Unwinnable War, Laurel Miller. Okay. okay. In the current events, in the foreign events article, in the unwinnable war, 
Erica's blind spots. In Afghanistan. By Laurel Miller. Enduring issues. So speak to conflicts. Desire for power. Interconnectedness and impact on the environment. Okay. Okay. While we will, okay, okay, the focus this current event summation will focus. Um, their enduring issue, conflict. However, however, it connects to however, However, um, the text, hi, how are you? Analysis. Touch upon, we'll reflect the others. We'll reflect. The other above mentioned interning issues as well. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. So, the enduring global conflict exists between the United States and Afghanistan. Okay. 
Okay. The conflicts are as follows. U.S. troops in Afghanistan versus in people, civilians. U.S. troops. I have to go. Can't make this up. Okay. Fighting. Afghanistan versus the Taliban. United States policy makers and war strategists versus Afghan civilians. Community leaders and Taliban. Leaders, forces. Okay. okay. Okay, I have to cut this. We will finish this. We will finish this. But I have to cut this video short. I'm so sorry. Part three. Part three. Let's go here. Okay, we'll do part three. I stop the share. I'm gonna get home tonight.